quickly through the, about the first first five. And, okay, uh, John. Um, just a moment. Thank you for uh, joining me. Today, we have a very special guest. His name is John Lander. He's an incredible man. And apart from being either fluent or conversant in, I think, six languages, correct, John? He is the... <laughs> former Thanks. ambassador to the Republic of Iran, as well as vice ambassador to China back in 1974. Now, as a young man, John went to work in the Department of Foreign Affairs and was involved in preparing the conditions necessary to create the relationship, the new relationship between China and Australia back then in 1972. <laughs> the reason that John is an important guest today is because he was, um, that was 50 years ago this day, that that relationship was signed off on. Um, <clears throat> and for the last 24 hours, Penny Wong, the Australia's Minister for Foreign Affairs, has been in Beijing, and it looks very positive so far. The information I'm seeing from both Australian media and Chinese media is very positive, so we're going to talk about that today. So after a very brief introduction there, I'd like to welcome you, John. It's a great honour for me, personally, to wish you good afternoon, and thank you for agreeing to be my guest today. Thank you. Um, just one point of clarification. I was once, only on one occasion, uh, the deputy ambassador in Beijing when we were opening up the embassy in the um, early to mid-70s. Uh, but I was the director of the China section of the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, on three separate occasions. Uh, so um, going back to your first, first point about the early days, um, uh, when I was posted to Kuala Lumpur in 1967, uh, I started studying Chinese at a local Chinese temple just as a hobby. Uh, when I got back to Canberra in uh, 1970, uh, I was working in the Southeast Asia Division and actually on the Cambodia desk. Uh, and then I was transferred to the China section uh, <coughs> to work on the you know, all of the paperwork to prepare for uh, the change of government with the advent of Prime Minister Whitlam and his determination to recognise the People's Republic of China. Um, so we had two parallel sets of papers being worked up. One was for Whitlam in case he won, and the other one was for the, the other lot in case they won. Um, <laughs> so we were working out how we would continue our relationship with the ROC, the Republic of China based on Taiwan, or to terminate that and to move to uh, a full diplomatic relationship with the People's Republic of China. So, so it was only the, the Whitlam government that was planning to recognize the People's Republic of China? Yes, oh yes, the, the um, as we refer to it as the coalition government, the Liberal and the National, um, mm -hmm. which used to be called the Country Party. Um, Right. the coalition right-wing government was still uh, basically maintaining the proposition that uh, they would continue relations with uh, the ROC. Mm. So uh, one we of the... We were aware at the time how historically significant that that period would become. Uh, that would suggest that I had a level of prescience which I don't own. Um, it was it was a job. Um, we were more focused on the immediate task. Um, uh, China was a very, very, very different place back in 1971-72, and indeed in 74 to 76 when I was actually in Beijing. Um, and so it wasn't really possible to foresee where things would go, uh, neither from the Australian side or from the Chinese side for that matter. I mean, I don't think anybody anywhere expected uh, the the lightning speed with which China changed and advanced. Um, and, you know, had we had any idea that that was what was going to happen, I think we might have had a, uh, you know, a quite different perspective on it. Uh, yeah. It was just that, that Whitlam felt that, uh, you know, China... Uh, as impoverished as it was, and it was a desperately poor country uh, when the uh, Communist Party of China actually established the People's Republic. And even in 1970, 71, 72, 
it was still extremely poor. Um, yes. And uh, we had no expectation that it would rise so quickly, I don't think. I certainly didn't. Um, and it was just the, the view from, from the Whitlam side that despite its, um, its impoverishment and that China was a great civilization, uh, a vast territory and a huge population, mm. and that it made absolutely no sense for Australia as a, as a minor player um, or a middle range player in our own region, it made no sense at all not to have dealings with China. Mm. And that was the were you, were you driving conscious? motivation. At the time, China was still going through the Cultural Revolution. Uh, Australia was four or five years ahead of, of America in recognizing the People's Republic of China. Is that right? Uh, well, yes, technically. Um, of course, uh, the Australians, we, we in Australia were somewhat blindsided by Kissinger's secret visits to, to mm. Beijing. We had absolutely no idea that they were taking place until the announcement that Kissinger was going to visit Beijing. Oh, sorry, that uh, Nixon was going Nixon, to visit Because Kissinger Beijing. had already been. And yeah. uh, Kissinger had been, I think, seven times. Uh, right. And we knew, we knew absolutely nothing about it. And wow. I can tell you, uh, since neither of the key people, I think, are still with us, uh, my father-in-law, Sir Keith Waller, who had just become the secretary of the department, and had previously been six years ambassador to Washington, he swapped places with uh, Sir James Plimsoll, who became ambassador to Washington. Uh, and those two gentlemen were livid about the fact that uh, despite the closeness of our alliance partnership, we had been com kept completely in the dark. Um, and <laughs> uh, that I think was one reason why in the department, right from the very top um, we worked enthusiastically to uh, get the formal recognition done as quickly as possible um, so Australia Australia was three or four years ahead of um, America in actually creating the situation for diplomatic and trade relations right? yeah the formal recognition of the People's mm -hmm. Republic of China as the sole legal government of China um, uh, was in 1972 for us uh, but it wasn't until 1979 that um, the, uh, Jimmy Carter announced yes. the, the recognition, the formal recognition and the establishment of diplomatic relations. Mm -hmm. And the formula that you can still um, see his address, if you search for it on YouTube, it's easy to find, where he announces uh, the, the establishment of diplomatic relations. He uses exactly the same formula that we did. Right. So, uh, so America, it, America it, were being led in their foreign policy then by Australia at the time. It seems a little different to today. That, that's a bit of an overreach. <laughs> Quite a bit uh, of an overreach. You led the way. We were, still, we were still being led in our foreign policy because, we, you know, we accelerated the move to recognize China because the United States had taken significant steps to the normalization of its relations with China. I don't think there's any... Um, any possibility to argue that, that we uh, were instrumental in uh, motivating the United States to recognize China. The mm -hmm. motivations, Kissinger's motivations and Nixon's motivations were um, principally uh, geostrategic uh, and also um, economic. Yeah. Would they so, have been related to the, uh, the end of the Vietnam War as well? Uh, well, the Vietnam War hadn't ended uh, in uh, 1971. It was no, so by the time uh, America... But by, by the, well, I think that's probably, yes. Um, the, the war ended in 1975 and they recognised China in 1979. Right. Um, so the, the two things were somewhat related. Um, the main thing about the Vietnam War was that even before it ended, I think Australia had come to the realization that the the myth of uh, the yellow peril of Chinese communism flooding through Southeast Asia all the way down to Australia uh, 
and the dominoes falling all of yeah. those were um just myths uh yeah. and bore no relationship to um reality or i'm always of the view that um, australia america the uk most of europe they, they would never fall to communism because they're just culturally very different you know the individualism versus the collectivism uh southeast asia certainly has it china has it they're a collective group of people whereas australians are not so much no that's correct um and of course china has been adamant from day one that it sees no purpose to be served mm. by trying to export their particular system um and i think they rightly perceived that it did not matter whether uh, a country is communist or uh, authoritarian or um, you know a monarchy or a democracy what matters is as far as the united states is concerned is whether the country is aligned to united states interests i mean we can see that in the case of saudi arabia it's a kingdom it's highly mm. authoritarian um <clears throat> it it breaches human rights which the united states gets very really hit up about when it's somebody else but not saudi arabia um, yeah or india for that for that matter uh well i I'm, i don't know so much about india's human rights uh, record um but i do know something about australia's human rights record and it's not a good one mm. um and the thing is of course the soviet union moved away from the old soviet style of communism and moved to um a more capitalist approach uh it made absolutely no difference the, the the united states was was and still is obsessed with the objective of destroying russia mm. yeah nothing uh, to do with communism it's just destroying no, russia no communism is just an excuse for opposing uh, a country can i that, can i take you back 50 years when you first arrived in beijing what was it like uh gray <laughs> the, the, <laughs> The overwhelming impression of Beijing was that it was exceedingly grey. Everything was grey. Of course, mm. they used those grey bricks for building all the traditional buildings, and uh, and all the more recent buildings at that time were still basically constructed out of the same materials. Yeah. Um, the there was very little in the way of decorative embellishment to the city. Um, that uh, you know the streets were just. There were some main boulevards like Chang'an leading into Tiananmen Square, which were uh, basically vast expanses of, of uh, tar um, and light poles and some newly planted trees which had not yet grown. The one thing I know mm. I remember about the trip in from the airport was uh, all these saplings which were being propped up by um, tripods. So they were they had already started um, an attempt at um, beautification and, yeah. uh, and beautification of the city, but it was absolutely <laughs> rudimentary. Um, and the other thing that, that was very, very noticeable was the extremely low standard of living, um, even for those who were um, nominally uh, designated as, as middle class. Um, mm. uh, at night, for instance, you would see occupants of the tower blocks of, of apartments, which were basically rooms, uh, for a couple of rooms per family with a common communal kitchen and communal uh, washing facilities uh, and toilet facilities at the end of the floor on these mm. high rise blocks. Um, and on a summer's evening, you would see most of the occupants sitting in the street under the street lamp because the lighting within the apartment blocks was so poor. So you'd wow. see groups of men playing cards or uh, playing mahjong and so on, sitting on the street corner. Um, you still see them. Yeah, but not so much. I mean, this was, no. was, was really very, very remarkable. And the other really noticeable thing was that the only vehicles, uh, motor vehicles that we saw were military. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and of course, either military green or military grey or military blue, which are all very sort of done colours. No, yes. There were no bright colours. The only mm. the only bright colours you ever saw were very small children, 
um, who were still dressed in, you know, the brightly coloured children's clothes. But once a child reached the age of seven, they, they dressed in the same blue-grey outfits that everybody else did. Uh, yeah. And of course, uh, the streets were absolutely jam-packed with um, push bikes. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of push bikes with the occasional army truck trying to get through. Mm -hmm. um, whereas today, of course, it's a very different picture. Uh, yeah. When was the last time you visited China? Uh, 2019. I was there for um, the uh, celebration of the Chinese New Year in 2019 um, in Taiwan, actually, in Shanxi. Yeah. Um, at a hospital there. <laughs> I'd been invited by um, a, a doctor who was a, a famous pediatrician, in, a, a pediatric, not pediatrician, um, a, a orthopedic, uh, orthopedic person. Um, and he suggested I go up to um, Taiwan as he had work to do there. And it's an interesting part of the country. Mm. Uh, but I'll get on to that. Let me just finish off with life in Beijing in 1974 to 76. Um, there was only one hotel that was had any standing, I would say, as an international hotel, which was the, the Beijing Hotel. Um, my wife and I and my two little toddlers were initially accommodated in the Xinjiang Fangjian, which was another extremely grey, rather grim, uh, Soviet-style building um, with very little in the way of um, comfortable amenities, although we did have our own private bathroom. Um, and then after six months, we were allocated an apartment that had been uh, provided by the Chinese government. Um, mm. uh, we, we were given a, a, an apartment block to accommodate the embassy staff. Um, <clears throat> And there were some funny stories related to um, furnishing that, which I can perhaps <laughs> tell you as well. But uh, <clears throat> uh, then, sorry, you've lost you. You lost me for a second. We're here to talk about that history, so feel free to go ahead. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, a couple of illustrations of the lack of contact. The only people that we were able to have any meaningful conversation with were people who were officially designated to deal with us as foreigners. Um, so, for instance, when we took our two little toddlers down to the local park to play in the, the playground, uh, all the Chinese children who were playing, uh, the one of the IEs supervising them would snap out an order and the kids would all disperse and stand in a circle around the play equipment uh, and watch while our two kids used the play equipment, which wow. is pretty, uh, pretty unnerving for them. But contact between our children and the Chinese children was absolutely not allowed. Hmm. Where did they I, go to school? Uh, they went to school at the Australian school, which was we set up. Um, and uh, in fact, the Americans, when they were uh, in Beijing as the United States liaison office, which they set up before they established full diplomatic relations, uh, they also attended our, our school, our embassy school. Um, so that was, that was one example. If I tried to strike up a conversation with a passerby on the street, within minutes, um, a public security bureau officer would come up and demand to know what we were talking about. And wow. the person I was trying to talk to would scuttle away. Um, most people would, even if I approached them, would scuttle away uh, because they knew that they would get into trouble if they were seen talking to me. So, how did you practice your Chinese then? <laughs> uh, I could go to designated shops which were open to foreigners, like the Friendship, Friendship. Store, uh, and I could go to Liu Li Chang, which was um, a street uh, in Shenmen where uh, foreigners were allowed to go shopping, uh, mostly for antiques and works of art and stuff like that. But, um, and we could go to uh, restaurants, uh, but w if we went into a restaurant, we'd be immediately ushered into a private room so yes. that we had no contact with the 
the local customers. So it was very much living in a fishbowl. Uh, we, I could leave Beijing and go and visit other parts of China, but in order to do so, I would have to get permission from the foreign ministry. Uh, and um, the only way we could visit any other part of the country was by train or occasionally by plane. Um, and upon departure, we would have to check into the Public Security Bureau who would make a note of the fact that we were leaving Beijing uh, and uh, take our details and passport number and so on. Uh, and then when we arrived in wherever we were going, we would be met at the railway station by a Public Security Bureau or China Travel Service person mm -hmm. who would have the job of uh, shepherding us around and ensuring that we didn't go anywhere that we shouldn't go and we didn't see anything that we shouldn't see um and the other this, thing this is really interesting to me because this is the image that western media portrays of china today this is what i think they would like people to believe china is like right now um, well, although i've never experienced any of the, that the, the contrast <laughs> could not be greater um mm. <clears throat> the uh you know, the only way we would be able to get, take leave uh, from the embassy would be to take a 36 hour steam train from Beijing down to Guangzhou and then a train from there to the border and then to walk across the border into Hong Kong. And then in Hong Kong, either spend a few days in Hong Kong or catch a flight to somewhere else, um, wow. like going to Penang, for instance, for a, um, a seaside holiday or something like that. Um, so getting around China was was exceedingly difficult especially for foreigners um, and indeed even for the for uh, local Chinese um, at that stage um, the people were registered in the city or the county or the village where they resided and they had to provide a reason uh, for moving from one place to another uh, whereas today the thing that I struck me most forcibly when I first started I resumed visiting China and I should say, I retired from foreign affairs in 1996, mm. and I did not resume <clears throat> visiting China until 2000, and, or I think it was the year 2000, um, when I visited my cousin, who was the Associate Professor of English in the School of Business at the Department of Economics in Shanghai University. Right. Uh, and I found it quite shocking. It, it really took me aback uh, that people would actually Chinese citizens in the street would actually talk to me or would invite me to come for a meal um, yeah and I thought no they're not supposed to do this they'll get into trouble <laughs> of course, that's changed. They, they're, they're very hospitable changed. people yeah. oh exceedingly uh, mm. there's no doubt about that but uh, the 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 freedom of movement in China is today absolutely remarkable by comparison to what it was when I was there during the tail end of the Cultural Revolution. Mm -hmm. The other thing that was the reason we, our, we were so circumscribed was that um, it wasn't until the Cultural Revolution was well and truly over that um, the, what I call Fissiparis tendencies, the, the tendency for China to break apart uh, was still right i mean um the gang of four was still pursuing the anti-confucius campaign which was uh, a campaign to try to un unseat premier Zhou and lai um there was even reports that the gang of four was attempting to mount a military coup from shanghai uh, against the the authorities in beijing uh, to take over uh, in beijing um Quite frequently, when we would apply to visit um, some far-flung place uh, elsewhere in China, we would say, oh, that city is closed for the moment uh, because uh, obviously there was some... Um, something happening. Uh, something happening there that, that needed to be um, uh, pacified or... Yeah. I, I so, some people well. some people say the same thing is happening with COVID. You can't go there because COVID's the excuse, but there's something going on. And it really does um, seem to me like the, the it, media reports of today are talking about a China of 50 years ago, your experience of China. 
yeah, it, it yeah. looks like that's what <laughs> well, they see, true. Once I resumed visiting China in 2001, I went almost, I went every year and sometimes twice a year, um, mm -hmm. summer and winter. Um, and every time I visited, I was even more forcibly struck by, in particular, the freedom of movement and the freedom of contact. Um, on, on one holiday, uh, we, I, I wanted to stay in the Xinjiang Fandian to see how it had changed. So, um, and as it was no longer the gloomy, dismal place that we knew uh, when we were dealing with um, mm. the kids having chicken pox. They, they, they got chicken pox while we were stuck in that hotel. Uh, but it was completely transformed. Uh, yeah. It was now a Novotel with a whole new um, front section, which was state of the art. Um, room service was delivered by robots, which uh, announced themselves and spoke to you. Um, yes. <laughs> and, it, and it was so bright and clean and and uh, and modern and modernized, it was mm -hmm. totally unrecognizable. It was only when I went round the back to have a look at the old part, uh, I could recognize the building from the outside. Uh, <clears throat> but when we when we went on a visit to Guilin, uh, a friend said, oh, when you come back from Guilin, you don't need to stay in a hotel, you can stay in my house. And I thought, oh, you know, we'd have a guest room in, in her house. No, she gave us a house. Oh, to stay in. That's nice um, of her. A whole house, uh, mm. because she was um, um, a property developer uh, mm. who had developed a whole uh, massive um, condominium of or housing community, um, very very um, upmarket housing community, um, mm. and she had a number of houses that still hadn't been sold, so. We got one of them for, for while we were for eleven days while we were back in Beijing. Uh, Very kind of her. Yeah. Extremely hospitable. We, um, mm. we had dinner with with her and many of her friends and uh, other friends, um, uh, and conversation was always very open. Um, I didn't ever get the feeling that the people I was talking to felt that they had to guard their tongue. Um, no. They. They express their opinions about government policy. The one thing that they, of course, did not do uh, was express opposition to the party, uh, because basically they, I, I got the impression they were pretty satisfied mm -hmm. with the policies that the party was pursuing in terms of economic development and social development and yeah. uh, what they like to call bottom-up uh, democracy. Um, yeah. The well, the, the great thing I've noticed in China, people don't hide their wealth at all anymore. They, 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 people who are wealthy are able to flaunt that wealth if they want. And if they want, it's, to. If they want to. I mean, a lot of people don't. They're quite modest about it, but they don't need to hide anything. And I've, I've had exactly the same experience as you. We hear criticisms all the time, but criticisms of uh, personal inconvenience of business inconveniences, very, very good. Well, the, you made the point about COVID uh, and not being able to visit a certain city because it was going through a COVID emergency. I don't think mm -hmm. that's a sign of anything else other than what it says it is, uh, because we've been able to uh, chat to people in such places, um, yes. like I've been talking to you about the fact that you've just had COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. And presumably, you've remained in isolation during the period of. of, of um, Correct. When your, we finish this interview, we're going shopping for the first time in over a week. Yeah, uh, can't wait. So um, it's it's not the same deal at all um, mm. as the uh, as I said the, the circumscribing of contact between foreigners and local people. Mm. Somebody likes your comment. Bottoms up democracy. Um, <laughs> well, I call it bottoms up in Chinese. Of course, is Gambay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. But I call it consultative governance. I I don't like the yeah, use I of the word democracy. It, well, it kind yes. of gives it a bad taste to me. Well, well yes, because the, the the word democracy has taken on such a taint in yes. the way in which uh, uh, the so-called democratic coalition has pursued the imposition of democracy as uh, I've forgotten which was the British politician when uh, the 
the coalition of the willing or the or NATO, a group of NATO countries bombed Libya to get rid of Gaddafi. He says, see, you can drop democracy on a country from 10,000 feet. Um, yes. Uh, and, and it's the antithesis of democracy because democracy is supposed to be about people making a choice. And yes. when you give people no choice, you are not being democratic. Um, I, but I think the I, idea I've noticed of this, um, we, we probably should avoid getting into too much detail, but it seems that if you don't listen to the people, then the people have no choice other than to become violent. You can have a silent protest, a peaceful protest, and if people listen to you and change things as they do in China, then those protests don't need to go any further. But right now we're seeing throughout the world all kinds of democratic countries are having to change and improve or increase their laws to stop these protests from becoming more and more violent. And the only reason they're becoming more and more violent is no one's listening to them. That I think is yeah, correct. Yeah. Um, we're not here really to analyze uh, Western no. society. <laughs> but but uh, I've just finished reading a book by Gore Vidal, which he it was published in 2001 called how we came to be so hated uh, and he's looking at exactly that question and he makes the point he, he quotes from um, uh, one of the supreme court justices who said at the time when a government breaks laws in order to enforce law it is teaching the people a powerful lesson mm. and the people then abandon respect for the law Correct. Uh, that's a paraphrase of what he said. Yeah, but, but it, it effectively it, it effectively reinforces what you just said. People in China don't need to criticize the party because the party is listening to the complaints that they have and the concerns. Because they vociferously criticize the policies. Yeah, they, if you if you really want to criticize the the uh, the your local government, you pick up the phone and dial one two three four five in any city in China. Uh, you <laughs> yeah. can actually organize protests yeah. to go to the government office, and and it's I, I just did a video about this. Article thirty five says you have the rights to protest and demonstrate. You have that right as long as you keep it peaceful uh, in China. Yeah, that's right. And 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 uh, you know we were talking on WeChat with with a friend uh, in China who did exactly that. Mm -hmm. um but um, he went a little bit too far in in that he was um uh also on wechat expressing his um his dissatisfaction with uh, the way he had it i don't know what the incident was but he felt he'd been not well handled by the police so he then went to complain about that but then he also complained about it online to mm. lots of other contacts and so he, of course he was called in and was asked um, firmly but fairly politely not to um, stir up um, dissatisfaction against the this police harmony. as such creating yeah. creating a, an alienation between the, the the people and the and the um, mm. what's they called it the the, the harmony security, it's a, the security the, personnel the the, the uh, local the, 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 the biggest thing the, about the, the, the big the boan is the local police and yeah. uh, and you've got the gongang which is the public police the public um, I, and i love the way they, they this this is an anachronism and an anachronism going back many years the word public security has been changed from public safety gong an is public safety yeah uh, but it's but the the english interpretation of gongan which is a public security bureau and i think that's that's a very typical western media yeah. style of thing to well, turn a, this it's, word it's, public it's, it's safety using, into security a translation to create the, a more nefarious impression yeah um, yeah I, I think there's a lot of them in the chinese language should but, we I, i've got another question about about what we originally came on to talk about in 2015 Australia and China signed the, the free trade agreement and things were going really, really well between us. There were some minor problems, but they were going really, really well. Um, what do you think was the thing that caused things to go so badly? 2015, December, signed free trade agreement and everything was good. What then happened? 
Uh, I think it's necessary to go back in history. Um, from the time that uh, uh, Kissinger and Nixon decided that they needed to uh, recognize uh, the PRC, the principal motivation was, in fact, geostrategic to ensure that that China and the Soviet Union did not form an alliance. Right. Uh, <clears throat> at the same time, uh, China's vast population uh, and widespread poverty uh, created a, a situation which was ripe for exploitation by Western companies who could uh, establish themselves in China with a very cheap labor force uh, to produce goods uh, that were previously being produced in the United States. Uh, and of course, uh, gain access to the Chinese market. So from then until the end of the 20th century, uh, 25 to 30 years, uh, uh, pretty much, um, there's, was, that was a window of opportunity for Australia. We could pursue a similar um, approach to China, uh, and we did, uh, and developed a, a very powerful trading relationship with China from Australia's point of view, um, where China became our single most important trading partner. 30% mm. of total trade is dependent upon China uh, for Australia. But Australia is not a vital market for China. Um, it's something like three or 4% of China's Ooh. world trade uh, mm. is actually shipped to Australia. So we don't matter much to China, but China matters enormously to us. What happened, I think, was the dawning realization in the United States that it was becoming increasingly difficult, if not impossible, for the United States to compete with China on economic terms. Uh, China was had developed economically so quickly, had such uh, <coughs> an annual growth rate that had never been seen before in any country in the world, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and was becoming more and more uh, an economic world heavyweight. Um, and China is the major trading partner for uh, over 160 countries in the world, including the United States. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, what to do became the question. And the answer to that was, uh, unfortunately, uh, to use military means. Um, if you cannot cannot uh, beat another country on the terms of uh, your national wealth uh, and your financial and economic position, then there is no doubt that still in, in this, right at this present moment, the United States still has the world's most overwhelming military power. Um, it, its uh, military budget this year is still vastly greater, three or four times more than China's military budget although the United States keeps pointing the finger at China and saying, oh, the rapid development of China's uh, uh, military capability is a threat to the world. Uh, but from its uh, 800 plus bases all around the world, including four major ones in Australia and, and a number of other minor ones, I think last count there were 12 total in Australia, um, it is quite clear that uh, with um, all of these bases basically aiming at other countries, that the United States is the one that's threatening other countries, in particular threatening China. Mm -hmm. So, um, but to, in order to counter the rise of China, the United States decided that they were going to pivot to Asia, as announced by um, President Obama. Obama in his visit to Australia in 2011. Mm -hmm. um, that really started taking hold in about 2014. Um, so by 2015, when we were still in a sort of halcyon period with China, um, things were already being already coming unstuck. Um, and of course, it wasn't until uh, a few years later, uh, particularly with the Turnbull government, that um, Australia was persuaded or had its arms twisted by the United States to adopt a more hostile approach to China. 
and this I think is one of the I mean you you mentioned before the the latest developments in terms of Penny Wong's visit to Beijing uh, the meetings between her and uh, the yes. foreign minister prior to that the meeting between uh, Anthony Albanese and Xi Jinping uh, and the very positive language emerging from that meeting um, that you know things are on a better a better footing mm -hmm. but the Chinese are not stupid and um, the, certainly the, the the government of China is not stupid they observe everything that is taking place uh, and whilst the Australian attitude has become more amenable to China and China has has responded with a more amenable approach to Australia they no doubt have a very clear picture of Australia's military preparations um, and Australia's acceptance of uh, the creation, particularly in Northern Australia, of um, Australia becoming the principal base of United States operations, power, power projection capability in the Indo-Pacific. And it's fairly clear, of course, that with everything that the United States says about the rationale for uh, establishing such a heavy footprint in Australia um, is directed at China. They make no secret mm -hmm. of it. So Australia is caught into the, in this paradox. We say we want a mutually beneficial trading relationship. We say we want at least a polite um, exchange of views on a regular basis to reach understandings on on issues and so on but at the same time uh, we have in particular our defense minister uh, mouthing the same uh, message that comes out of Washington that Australia has to prepare itself uh, militarily for the threat from China and as he put it uh, the acquisition of uh, uh, all these new armaments, the establishment of nu nuclear capable uh, bombers at Tyndall Air Base in, in the Northern Territory, the operation of the so-called Joint Surveillance uh, Intelligence Facility at Pine Gap and so on. All of these things, because they make Australia militarily more formidable, they reinforce Australia's sovereignty. That is a view um, that is shared by a number of, of uh, pundits in Australia, in particular, of mm -hmm. course, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, which is a front for, has become a front for United States influence in Australia, political and economic and military. Um, but it is a view that's not shared by myself or, or indeed a lot of other experts who are far more expert than I. Um, we, I, I differ from people like John Menadieu and Richard Tanter and uh, Hugh White and um, or you name it, any one of those such people, Emma Shortis, uh, her, her book on uh, our, uh, what did she call it, our, um, our Exceptional Friends, I think was the title <coughs> of her book. Okay. Um, Exceptional uh, Friends is a good name. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, Malcolm Fraser called, called them our dangerous allies. Um, all of these observers that I've mentioned and many others I haven't mentioned, uh, keep bewailing the fact that the uh, increasingly heavy footprint of United States forces in Australia, and we now have a permanent command base, a US command, Marine command base in, uh, in Darwin, Darwin uh, and it will be some, I was at 15, two or 2,500 troops. It's currently 2,500, but the plan to expand that. Well, and, it, and plans to expand that. Uh, troop uh, Marines rotating through, uh, through Darwin. Um, it's also planned to expand regular rotations of the Air Force and the Navy through Australian bases. Um, so all of this is uh, leading to what most of these observers say is uh, the inevitability of Australia being drawn into a war against China prosecuted by the United States. 
I know where you're going with this because uh, I am hundred percent in agreement with you. It's Peter, not going to be a war. Peter Vargesi, who was the former head of the Office of National Assessments, for instance, uh, it said the the direct risk of structuring our defence forces to fight alongside the United States rather than primarily for the defence of Australia could lead to Australia being dragged into a war that would not be in our interests. Um, and yes, of course, I don't disagree with that. If the United States were to go to war uh, against China, we would definitely be involved. There is no getting around that. But I am strongly of the view that given that the national defense strategy um, of the United States since um, it was not was not greatly revised by the Biden administration, uh, envisages the conduct of proxy wars uh, on behalf of the United States against its adversaries, and I think that's the language they have used. Yep. That, um, <clears throat> that from here on in, the United States will concentrate on its two principal adversaries, Russia and China. And China is the major uh, systemic threat, according to uh, the uh, American. Yeah, uh, I'm of the advisors. opinion that the, the safest place in Australia, if that situation arises, would be Tyndall Air Force Base or Pine Gap, because they're the places because that are US never going to be hit. Mm. Uh, especially, especially Tyndall, because it's it's very likely to have nuclear bombers located there. And yeah. the one thing that both China and the United States will avoid uh, as Escalating. much as they possibly can is, of course, any kind of nuclear conflict. And that is yeah. the reason why the United States, uh, Biden himself said, there will not be United States boots on the ground in Ukraine, um, specifically to avoid the potential for a, a nuclear exchange between Russia and the United States. Mm -hmm. And Russia has gone along with that fiction um it has on many occasions said united states is a belligerent in the war uh in ukraine but um it's gone along with the idea that the united states is not a, an active participant with active forces on the ground in ukraine and so therefore to in a sense the united states has stayed on the sidelines mm. um, and uh, in the case of China, uh, it was made very clear that uh, the whole purpose of Taiwan uh, and the United States policy towards Taiwan was to create a situation in which China would feel it had no other option but to use military means to prevent uh, Taiwan from seceding from China's mm -hmm. sovereign territory. And yeah, so the, and the, this, loss, the loss of part of its land, yeah. Yeah, so this strategy of, of proxy wars uh, had various, envisaged various stages. Uh, to start with, a worldwide media campaign, which has been going on for several years already, to portray China as the aggressor, you know, the China threat. And then goading China into taking military action to prevent Taiwan's secession, which we've also seen stepped up enormously recently. Uh, Pelosi's visit to Taiwan was a yep. clear provocation in that direction. The subsequent visit by other members of the United States Congress um, uh, and so on. The, the idea would be then if, the, if uh, fighting broke out between mainland and the province, uh, in other words, a resumption of the civil war, uh, that the United States would sustain Taiwan sufficiently to keep China bogged down. And again, that's a quote from, from their, uh, their policy. So hampering its economic development and its infrastructure cooperation with other countries. But the United States would have no direct military engagement in order to maintain the full capacity of United States forces, whilst China's would be significantly depleted. And of course, a nuclear Holocaust would be uh, avoided. Avoided, yeah. Now, uh, yes. Biden ha has publicly reaffirmed adherence to the One China principle on many occasions, including most recently in Bali. 
uh, and uh, has stated that uh, the United States would pursue competition with China and uh, Jake Sullivan, um, the um, National Strategic, Strategic Advisor, uh, said the same thing, China, that the United States would be fiercely competitive, but not going so far as actual conflict. The one thing that those two gentlemen did not say, and no one else has said, is that the United States would uh, draw back from arming and equipping and encouraging various proxies to undertake the war against China on the United States' behalf. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is quite clear, I'm sure, to any strategic analyst in, in Beijing looking at Australia and where Australia is going with its military co co coalition um, with the United States. And now, of course, with the incorporation of Japan, uh, and Japanese forces will now be exercising together with Australian and United States forces in Australia to develop interoperability between all three. And I think uh, Miles's, uh, the, the Defence Minister's uh, description of uh, having gone further than inter interoperability to interchangeability is a further sign that Australia has allowed itself to be positioned as a proxy for the United States in a war against China. The encouraging signs are, of course, the recent uh, county and municipal elections in Taiwan made it pretty clear uh, that the general population in Taiwan is not interested mm. in moving to independence in the immediate future. No, that's uh, right. That it is correct that a, a majority, probably a very large majority of the population, would like independence, if possible, at some time in the future. But they're very uh, clear that, that they do not want to pursue uh, immediate independence. And in fact, the results of the election in Taiwan were welcomed by Beijing's Taiwan Affairs Office with a short statement saying, the people of Taiwan have chosen peace stability and a good life. Yes. So both sides of the strait have, I think, moved to a position of sustaining the status quo between them, which of course is gradually evolving into a far more complex intertwining of Taiwan, especially economically and financially, and the mainland. There are vast mm. numbers of Taiwanese people who work in factories on the main, in mainland China, yeah, you know many. Yeah, there's there's a, a traffic back and forth the whole time, um, mm -hmm. and the uh, financial cooperation between the two is is enormous. Um, the des the the largest destination for Taiwanese investors in the world is mainland China. Correct. And <clears throat> one of the largest, if not the largest, investor in Taiwan is mainland China. So this interlocking. This, this gradually taking place is what Xi Jinping means by the force of history, that mm. eventually uh, this process will see the peaceable reunification of the two, yes. um, possibly still under continuing different political systems. There, there are so just... many people who, who actually say that China plans to invade um, Taiwan. I've actually, I actually have friends in Australia who believe China will invade Australia very soon, as well. And, and this, <laughs> I, you laugh, but this, this is people believe this. People actually yeah. believe this, and, well, and they say, well, you, you can see that Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping, he actually said it. Uh, no, he didn't. Your media said that he said it. What he has said quite clearly is, we will defend our sovereign nation we consider yes, taiwan yes. is part of our sovereign nation yes, yes. if you try and take it away then there might be a war but if yeah, you, if I, you I, I think war, i think the position the position set out by xi jinping at the national people's congress was very clear and yeah. in my view it was absolutely no change no alteration to the position that was put to us in the negotiations during 1971 That's and that was 
the exact same position that Taiwan is a province of China. It's an integral part of China's sovereign territory. Um, and uh, China looks forward to the eventual full reunification of the, these two parts mm -hmm. uh, into, um, into the motherland. Yeah. Uh, I, I can he see added it, a caveat. Uh, he added the caveat systems. then, as he did uh, back in 1971, he's added the caveat that China will act militarily if necessary if any force within Taiwan or any outside force attempts to remove Taiwan from China's sovereign territory. Yep. Uh, th th that, that position hasn't changed. It's, it's not altered it's in, any, in, in any... It's a 70-year-old position. Yeah. It's a 70-year-old position. And, um, you know, when he restated that at the National People's Congress, it was immediately seized upon by commentators in the United States and the mainstream media as an indication that, that uh, Xi Jinping was stepping up the pressure on Taiwan and uh, advancing the timetable for invasion, um, uh, ignoring the fact that it's impossible for a country to invade its own territory, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, apart from that. Um, but <clears throat> with regard to this business of creating proxies, uh, and creating a situation in which uh, a war would break out. Um, despite Biden's placatory remarks to Xi Jinping, um, below that level, um, the, the United States is continuing goading China. Um, they're stationing, stationing the bulk of its naval power off the coast of China, conducting freedom of navigation and combat exercises in the South China Sea, and even going through the Taiwan Straits, visits by senior officials using military aircraft, um, which is a violation of China's airspace, uh, because if we agree that Taiwan is uh, an integral part of China's sovereign territory, then flying military aircraft, aircraft into Taiwan is in fact breaching China's yeah. airspace. Uh, creating a, a putative air defense identification zone which extends well over mainland China. I've actually flown through that several times myself. And, and, and then, of course, alleging that Chinese flights violate the ADIZ. Um, they secretly, secretly and now not so secretly, provide military training uh, on the ground in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And, of course, one of the most provocative things that was done uh, in 2021, was including Taiwan in the Summit for Democracy uh, on the 9th and 10th of December 2021, thus implying that it is an independent um, uh, democratic country. Um, and Australia has joined in this process. Um, many Australian uh, right-wing politicians have visited Taiwan, uh, certainly also in recent days. And... Uh, have continued until again recently talking about uh, the need to uh, protect ta Taiwan's um, democratic system and its in its right to self determination, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, there is no doubt that uh, if we were to rush in to save Taiwan from um, the armed forces of the People's Republic of China, we would be uh, pretty much destroyed in very short order. Yeah, you'd be the at war Chinese with the, Navy is already three times the size of the Australian Navy, and it's growing. <laughs> hmm. uh, we commanded control centers in Australia would be wiped out by Chinese missiles, and our former defense minister, our right-wing defense minister, uh, Peter Dutton, Peter uh, actually made it very clear in his address to a press club, that Australia has no defence against Chinese missiles, which can reach any city in Australia as far south as Hobart. So, but the reason uh, the reason he mentions that is not not because he's afraid of that war; it's because he wants funding for that through his friends in ASPI. Uh, oh yes, of course, and of yeah. course he, he he said it because he was trying to il illustrate how threatening China is. Uh, yes. because you know here we are we're faced with a, an adversary that has the capability to strike at the very heart of australia and mm -hmm. and 
many people have swallowed that line. Um, your friends who say that they're afraid that China is going to invade Australia are a, a case in point. They, yes. they, they, uh, they think that the fact that China has a capability to strike at Australia um, confirms a Chinese determination to do so. And those two things do not follow one from the other at all. Um, uh, no. There's, been never, there's never been any hint that China would do this. I mean, the only hints about this come from within Australia. Yeah, that is... That's exactly my point. If you, if you make even a cursory study of Chinese policy statements over the last 15 or 20 years, uh, you cannot find any policy statement which even suggests that China would use its military force to go beyond its own territory um, mm. and to attempt to take over other countries militarily. There's no suggestion of it in any policy document emanating from the Chinese side. Um, there's certainly a lot of uh, claims that this is China's uh, long-term aim coming from the, the Western side, um, yeah. which is, uh, I think, brings me on to, um, which I think we've said enough about the way Australia would be utterly destroyed by a war <coughs> with China. Yeah. Well, but, given, um, given that we history... Need to, we need to look at the, the underlying fundamental reason, which, of course, is always ignored uh, by um, policymakers, uh, people with policy responsibility in both the Australian and the United States government. And that is this... They never explain what they mean by China is a sis systemic threat. But that, I think, is the underlying reason. China's economic prowess and its, its financial uh, progress does present uh, a challenge, if not a threat, to the Western uh, financial, global financial order. The, the financial order since Bretton Woods and since and certainly since the abandonment of the Bretton Woods um, arrangements by um, this is Nixon, I think, who took the United States off the gold standard yep. and Into put it on to the, to the petrodollar uh, by agreement with Saudi Arabia. Um, the United States, uh, through the, the Anglo-American uh, financial um, network uh, established the, the US dollar as the preferred currency for um, national reserves of all countries and also the preferred currency for international exchange. Sales between countries, um, certainly throughout the latter half of the 20th century and the first quarter of the 21st century, um, are almost all, were almost always conducted through the medium of the US dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, and maintaining the supremacy of the United States dollar in the world financial system is, in fact, I think, the, the real reason for uh, this hostility to China, because China has been pursuing a policy of economic cooperation with most of the world, and certainly with the two thirds of the world that do not uh, intimately belong to the West. Uh, Australia is a, is, a, is, a, is a member of the West. Uh, Japan yes. is a member of the West. Japan is an honorary Western country. Um, and uh, uh, our whole uh, financial system is, is dependent upon continued participation in the, the Anglo-American banking system, in particular the SWIFT. You know, the system of worldwide international financial transactions. Um, well, China has been pursuing economic cooperation right across uh, the world, as far afield as uh, Latin America and the Arabian countries, particularly Saudi Arabia most recently, uh, right across Central Asia uh, and in Southeast Asia. Uh, it has entered into comprehensive, uh, comprehensive strategic partnerships with many countries, including Australia. Um, and uh, along with that has been an increasing willingness to do trade in local currencies, not using the dollar. 
Mm -hmm. Combined with that, of course, has been the United States weaponization of the US dollar by locking countries that it does not agree with out of the SWIFT system and uh, punishing countries that it doesn't agree with by uh, freezing the United States dollar assets. Uh, most notable case in point is Afghanistan, um, which is actually being starved by the United States withholding the uh, Afghanistan's national assets. Uh, I don't agree with the Taliban government in, in Afghanistan. I don't agree with their policies. I don't agree particularly with their policies towards women, but uh, that I do not believe gives any country and certainly not the United States the right to withhold assets, uh, monetary assets, which rightfully belong to the people of Afghanistan and which mm. would go a long way to um, stemming the impending starvation in that country. But <clears throat> it's the unraveling, the potential unraveling of the Anglo-American uh, financial dominance around the world, which I think is what they mean by the systemic threat. And so far at least, uh, the, China, the United States has not been able to counter China's initiatives uh, with regard to uh, development of, in particular, infrastructure development in the less developed countries. Um, it's come up with, uh, belatedly, some uh, initiatives to uh, try to counteract China's Belt and Road Initiative, for instance. Mm. But there's at least, I think it's now over 140 and getting close to 160 countries that have formally signed, uh, Belt and Road. Up, yeah. signed up to the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, Quite a number of those, of course, have not yet commenced any actual projects, but there is a vast number of countries that do have uh, significant projects under the Belt and Road Initiative, Indonesia <laughs> not the least. Um, <clears throat> and it's not just the high-speed rail project between Jakarta and Bandung, which is almost finished, but <clears throat> Indonesia recently announced that it was going to uh, move to ban the export of raw materials starting with nickel um, and, and and then moving on to other uh, strategic raw materials to uh, enforce the processing of these raw materials in Indonesia in order to develop Indonesia's economy. And guess who is the country which is providing Indonesia with the ability to smelt nickel in Indonesia? It's I'm China. Yeah, which would account for why uh, Indonesia has been very um, uh, lucky, shall we say, in, in receiving in, um, grants from this new PGII, which replaced the B3W. And uh, <laughs> I, I thought you might. Keep up with, I can't keep up with the acronyms. <laughs> the acronyms change every year. The, the G20 two, uh, 18 months ago started the, the Build Back a Better World, B3W. And yeah. then they changed changed it to the uh, partnership uh, for infrastructure, or something else, PGII. Yeah. I actually I just made a video, not a video. I wrote an article which was published by John Menadue just last week about oh, yeah. the PGII and and how little it has actually done. But I thought you'd appreciate this. I think you recognise the name of the, the yeah viewer. yeah yeah. I think and, and and you know I agree with that comment and it, absolutely. Mm. Um, yeah. I, Let, I, let's I, let's I move, move on. That, yeah. Yeah. Just, just before we do, um, a, a schoolyard analogy. If the biggest bully in the school insists that everybody plays in the playground according to his rules, or they get thrown out, eventually everybody will be thrown out and the bully would be left alone in the playground. Uh, yes. And that, of course, I think is what we can see happening uh, as countries like Iran and and uh, uh, Afghanistan and uh, you name it um, mm. are being shut out of the uh, the Anglo-American financial system. They're not going to sit idly by and just say, "Oh, we'll weep in a corner." They're they're moving well, rapidly to set up their own alternative system. Correct. And more and more <clears throat> countries are joining it. And of course, you mentioned the BRICS: the Brazil, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa have gone a very long way towards establishing 
uh, an alternative exchange system. Mm -hmm. uh, and and China, of the course, other one is RCEP, which will be doing the same. Yeah, and, and China, of course, has recently negotiated, uh, Xi Jinping visited Saudi Arabia. I think it's extremely significant that one of his very, very few visits abroad was to Saudi Arabia. Um, yeah. And uh, not only met with the, the Saudi government, but of course with the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, with Saudi alone, Xi Jinping signed 34 um, different uh, economic cooperation agreements covering right. um, the whole spectrum of fields in which uh, that kind of cooperation can take place from education to technology to, um, I've forgotten the list, I had the list in front of me, but I've lost yeah. it. <laughs> well, but, my, but it's quite amazing. Agriculture is a big one as well for the Middle East because yes, China yes, has yes, developed yes. a methodology of growing um, saltwater rice, for one thing. Uh, it has uh, massive desalination as well going on. There's a lot of different things going on in, inside of the Middle East. And I, I've, I've, well, I can't believe fun. how many different interactions, not just your 34 with Saudi Arabia, but the Middle East is right now a greater Bay Area target for business. There, there are chartered planes flying from Guangzhou and Shenzhen right now, almost every day, taking business people to the Middle East right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and of course, they, 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 were, they were doing that with, with all the Central Asian countries as well. And I think most people in Australia... SCO, yeah. The Shanghai Cooperation. Well, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. The Shanghai Cooperation organization, organization, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, so there's a lot happening. Which brings us now, back to the, 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 the question of, uh, of, of a war. I have, I have basically got one final question for you, which I think it might take a little while to answer. Um, you've just given a, a fantastic history with an in-depth knowledge of what's going on. We currently have, getting back to the Australia-China relationship, which is what this was all about today, just to remind viewers, is the 50th <laughs> anniversary of uh, relations between the two countries. And John, you were one of the people who put pen to paper to make this happen. And May I, I say, when I, uh, just sorry to interrupt, but when mm -hmm. I attended the celebrations at the Chinese embassy in Canberra to celebrate the anniversary of our relationship, uh, the Chinese ambassador very kindly uh, thanked me and congratulated me as a pioneer of that relationship. You were. You absolutely were. He didn't mention me, did he? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, the, the way that we are now, we, we have a history of a very good, solid foundational relationship all the way up to 2015, where Australia-China signed a free trade agreement. From there, it started to go downhill. We now have a, a hostile opposition. We have hostile backbenchers in, in, the, in the party. We have a hostile anti-China media. And we possibly have the world's most hostile think tank based in Australia, the Australian Security uh, Strategic Policy Institute, ASPI. Which, which, which should be called the American Subversive Propaganda Institute. <laughs> I agreed. Personally, I agree with that. With Given all of those things, Penny Wong is currently in Australia and she's getting good headlines. There's, there's also... She's in the China. Cabinet. Currently uh, in China. Yeah, Sorry, I said Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she's getting good headlines in both countries. Yeah. yeah. It looks like steps are going forward. How difficult a job is it going to be for her to sell China as not being as bad as is portrayed so that she can move forward in a positive way without having the negative hang-ups? Uh, putting it very simply, extremely difficult. Yeah. Um, she is, as I said, I think uh, Australia has a paradoxical policy to ch towards China. And the, the military and intelligence coterie in Canberra is extremely powerful and has, has had the direction of Australia's policy towards China now for quite a number of years. Uh, and unless Penny Wong is able to surround herself with people of very different views from those that are being put forward through the, the Five Eyes, uh, and through ASPE and uh, the Defence Department, um, 
I think she'll find it very, very difficult indeed to do anything other than stabilize the relationship at its present low level. Um, do you think that the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has Petty Wong's back? I have no idea. Have I have event? no idea. Um, I, I assume they do because uh, her visit to China would not, and, and her talks with with um, Foreign Minister mm -hmm. Wang Yi would not have happened without the support of, of our diplomatic service. Uh, so I think there are, uh, and I'm just assuming, that there are people within the Department of Foreign Affairs who do see China rather differently or see the need for Australia to pursue a different policy towards China, even if they don't see China that much differently. Um, and, you know, I'm not um, a China lover or a panda hugger or any of those things. Uh, I'm fully aware of uh, the shortcomings uh, of China, as just as I'm aware of the very aware of the shortcomings of Australia. Neither of us is perfect, but I do think that, and you know, I agree with what's been said by both Penny Wong and uh, Wang Yi this week that we need to focus on uh, finding points of common ground and building on those. Uh, but as long as we are pursuing a, a policy of military hostility towards China and, and trade or economic amity towards China, we're caught in a paradox. Um, and of course, one of the most unfortunate things is that over the years, uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs has been severely underfunded in comparison to the, uh, the military side of the government. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, I think she has a Herculean task, I think, firstly, in building up the capacity of her department and secondly, in ensuring that that capacity is directed towards a more rational and balanced approach to, towards China, um, mm -hmm. which, of course, was the foundation of the approach which Whitlam took and which we supported way back in 1971. It was, right. it was a realist appreciation of China's position in the world and a rational approach to giving effect to that understanding of where China sat in the world then. And that is even more important now. China mm -hmm. is, is probably the single most important country in the world bar none, despite the United States insistence that it is the supremo of the world in terms of uh, China's population, in terms of its economic capacity and its extraordinary capacity to keep developing. Yes. Um, I think it is far more important. And of course, China has adopted a, a, an economic approach, which is quite counter to the approach of Western countries. All Western countries are pursuing a, a financial approach to try to tame the inflation dragon, which is simply enriching the banks and impoverishing the people. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, no one can, can afford their mortgages anymore, uh, apart from anything else. Uh, everything is, is still more expensive, inflation hasn't come down, but people's real disposable income has been severely eroded. Whereas, uh, and because all of the, the uh, measures that are taken uh, enhance the position of the bank uh, or banks, the banking system. Whereas China, particularly through the, the People's Bank of China, has taken a different approach of uh, directing finance into product into what's going to as the productive economy, uh, expanding in particular uh, under the the latest um, National People's Congress, uh, they've announced the intention to provide further and easier financing for small and medium business uh, to uh, vastly increase the numbers of individuals who are able to uh, contribute to further economic okay. growth and yep. of course they, their incomes will go up they will get richer than they have been and they will have more disposable income which will then feed the new industries and enable them to continue growing and expanding uh, without inflation yeah our inflation rates here are very very low i mean i haven't been shopping for a week obviously being stuck at home with the COVID. but uh, from what i've seen here 
very little in the way of inflation. Uh, there's very little in the way of interest increases. There, there's none. Uh, mortgage rates haven't changed. Bank borrowing rates haven't changed. Uh, it, it's really a very different situation here. The cost mm. of gas has increased slightly. We buy gas by the bottle. Uh, our, our water. Yeah. And well, our, that's understandable. Our, that's understandable <coughs> given the... Yeah. the but of course, Australia, Australia always shoots itself in the foot. Um, we tie the, the domestic gas price to the international gas price, even though we could afford, um, with the cost of production of gas in Australia, to have mm -hmm. a vastly lower cost to households than, than uh, is currently the case. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think also that most of the people who are faced with uh, um, devastation of their mortgages and so on are a younger generation who are going to have uh, a clear memory of the crisis in 2008. That back in 2008, when I had a mortgage, I, w I ended up paying a, an interest rate on my mortgage of 21%. Yeah, I remember So we've this. got a long way to go before yeah. bank interest reaches 21%. I, I remember once when uh, I think it was back in 1991 or two, maybe, where my my mortgage repayment went higher than my monthly salary. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't. I, I sold my house. As simple as that. I, I couldn't meet the mortgage repayment from the salary I was in. I took yeah. out the salary. I took out the mortgage at 11 um, percent. It went up to 17 or 18 percent. So we're a long way from that, thank goodness. Yeah. It was, um, mm. Yes, it sat around uh, 17, 18% for quite a few years, uh, but it, yeah. did re it did at one point reach 21%, uh, which was great uh, for people who had money to invest, but not for those <laughs> yes. who, who had already <coughs> taken, taken out mortgages. Yep. Yeah, I, I was in that position. I moved from the UK to, to Australia in 87, bought a small house, uh, mortgaged myself to the maximum of my capacity, and then uh, s several years later, three or four years later, was in a position where I, s I simply couldn't afford to, to, to keep my house, had to sell it. Well, it's uh, oh, one hour and 22 have elapsed. Um, yes. And, and I am going yeah. to have to answer a call of nature any moment now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Might, uh, well, we, we did say we'd keep this to about an hour, but uh, it's been it's really been interesting. I mean, I love your insights into the China that we read about today, but really did once exist back in the 1970s. Yeah, yeah. and I think you're quite right that the the, the 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 narrative on China has not evolved with China. Uh, the mm -hmm. narrative has remained stuck in yeah. in the immediate post-war um, picture. Um, yeah. And yeah. Um, well. I, I would like to personally thank you for your insights today. It's been a, it's an incredible oh, sure. meeting um, meeting online here, and and we've had some good comments coming through. Um, we have been an hour and twenty minutes, and it is time that we we said goodbye to each other. But once again, an incredible time for Australia, and I do hope that, as your brother said, ASPI gets broken up. Once that <laughs> happens, we well, can that, start. That, the, yeah, that would be that would be marvelous, but it's not likely. No, um, the, and, the, and the problem and is, if it does get broken up, it, it, it may be, it may get broken up into twenty different pockets of the same kind of poison, and yeah. I think that's yeah. that's the worst yeah. thing that could happen. Yes, yes, it, it, cut, the head off the, cut the head off the hydra, and it just multiplies. Yeah, yeah, um, they need to cut the but, neck. Um, the head. Uh, you know, I I hope I've sufficiently conveyed uh, the view to those who are listening in that I'm, I am not very optimistic about the future of Australia's relations with China. Um, I'm trying to be optimistic about what's been happening in the last few days, and I think it's very encouraging. But uh, my view of the military expansion, especially the expansion of the United States presence in Australia, um, should give everyone uh, pause and cause for concern. Uh, because I still believe that the United States, as I put it some days ago, is not preparing to go to war against China. The United States is preparing Australia to go to war against China. On their behalf, yes. I, that's the way I view it too. Um, and the safest place is to move to Pine Gap because China <laughs> will never attack Pine Gap. 
uh, it, well, it, because they won't attack American interests inside of Australia, but they will for sure can and have the ability to destroy Sydney, but Brisbane, Melbourne. I think I, I think I would move to the Australian Research Station in Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> possibly a little cool down there in the summer <laughs> yeah all right john thank you very much okay, uh, well, let you we attend should, your we call should, we should and, do this uh, again <laughs> we should I, I would love to i would love to let's let's pencil in a time okay and uh, yeah we will thank you very much and thanks everybody we've got we're up to 77 viewers so that's good thank you everybody it is time to say goodbye and uh, john has already rushed off to attend that call of nature Thanks all for watching. See you all next time. Bye-bye for now.